You know, with modern-day warfare, if uh, a country is going to attack uh, a fortified uh, state or, or city, uh, a, a seemingly invincible city, they probably start out with uh, sending the bombers in, with you know, airplanes and bomb them, and, and, and then they would have the Navy sitting off in the sea and, and shooting their big guns at them, and, and then they'd bring in the heavy artillery and, 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 and pepper them with artillery and finally send in the ground troops. That, that's kind of the way general plan for, for warfare today. But you know, God had a different plan for his people. In Joshua chapter 6, starting verse 1, it says, Now Jericho was securely shut up because of the children of Israel. None went out and none came in. And the Lord said to Joshua, See, I have given Jericho into your hands, its king and the mighty men of valor. You shall march around the city, all you men of war, you shall go all around the city once. This you shall do for six days. And the seven priests shall bear seven trumpets of ram's horn before the ark. But the seventh day you shall march around the city seven times, and the priests shall blow the trumpets. It shall come to pass when they make a long blast with the ram's horn, and when you hear the sound of the trumpet, that all the people will shout with a great shout, then the wall of the city will fall down flat, and the people shall go up every man straight before them. This was God's battle plan for his people to go in and conquer a seemingly uh, impossible situation. That the city of Jericho seemed like there's no way anybody was going to be able to conquer that. And as we read this, one question I have come to mind is, why does God record all these incidents in the Bible? Not only the, the walls of Jericho falling down and how they conquered it, but you, you got Noah's Ark, you got Samson and Delilah, those three young Hebrews in the fiery furnace, David and Goliath, Elijah taking on those false prophets of Baal, you have Joan and the great fish, you, you got God's people wandering in the wilderness for 40 years so that generation dies off. And then Joshua chapter 7, you got God's people going in and being defeated at a little city called Ai. Why does God record all these historical events for us? See, sometimes it reveals the strength of God's servant. And most of the time, it just reveals his or her weakness. But you know, God tells us specifically why he records these events. In 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 6, it says, Now these things became our examples, to the intent that we should not lust after evil things, as they also lusted. In verse 11, Now all these things happened to them as examples, they were written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the age has come. Understand that phrase, these things, refers to Israel's history. All the recorded events that we have in the Bible, that's what this is talking about, these things. The good, the bad, and the ugly. And it says they are examples. Remember that Greek word for examples means to strike a blow, to leave a mark, to leave an impression. You understand that God has recorded these historical events in order that they may strike a blow in our minds and leave a pattern to see how God works in the life of his people. Do you understand God is just as willing today to perform miracles for his people as he was back in Joshua's day? I wonder, do we really believe that? Do we really believe that God is a miracle-working God? You see, today many people, they, they look at, at maybe their objective or their goal and they step back and they make plans. I'm going to take step one, step two, step three. I personally, that's what I'm like. That's my personality. I like to make my, my, have map out my plan, how I'm going to go, the strategy. And I do very well with that. And I've learned oftentimes God says what to do, but he doesn't exact, exactly say how to do it. And quite frankly, most of the time, I don't know what to do. But when God says move, I need to move. And usually it's after I moved, I can look back and I see, okay, these are the steps that God was having me take to get where he wants to go. Now, because circumstances and situations are not always the same, the pattern and the principles don't always appear to be the same. But as we step back and take a closer examination, it reveals that the pattern and the principles are always there. And the purpose of today's message is that we can learn the pattern, we can learn the principles that God has given to us for miracle-working faith. You see, God desires that we take this pattern and apply it to our lives every single day. Now remember, God owns everything. 
He's not interested in, in great feats as, as much as he is as people fulfilling their God-given role. And our purpose, understand, our purpose is to glorify God. We're, our purpose is to exalt him and let him be known to all the world. Folks, never forget this simple truth. We were made by whom? We're made by God. We're made for whom? And we're made for what? His glory. We're made by God, for God, and for his glory. You see, the stories we read in the Bible are real examples for us to follow and to learn from. And if the principles work for Joshua and the nation of Israel, they'll work for us today as well. Jericho is the gateway into Canaan. Canaan is a land flowing with milk and honey. It's the land that was promised to Abraham and all his descendants. And Joshua knew what that land was like. Remember, Joshua was part of the group, the spies that originally went in there and looked, out the land, looked at the land 40 years before. They'd gone and he, they saw the fruit. It truly is a land flowing with milk and honey. And God said, Canaan belongs to you, Israel. And what was true back then is true today. This land belongs to Israel. And Jericho was, was a city with high walls, seemingly invincible, great warriors. And before they could enjoy Canaan, they had to go through Jericho. And folks, I want you to notice the pattern. Usually when you have a God-given goal, when God gives us a goal, a new objective, a new dream in our life, there's going to be a Jericho. When God gives you a goal or a dream or a new objective there in your life, there's going to be a Jericho. And your Jericho, your Jericho is something that stands between you and the accomplishment of what God has in store for you. That's your Jericho. Is there a Jericho you're facing today? Is there something that seems impossible that has to happen in your life? What is that one thing that's standing between you and you becoming the man or the woman that God wants you to be? What is it that is, is like chained to your ankle, like, like a ball and chain that is holding you back, prevents you from experiencing God's best in your life? Folks, we never know what our potential is until we're stretched to the limit. Now, some of you are sitting here and you might be thinking something like this or you've thought this through, you know, God, I want. God, I wish that I could have. <laughs> if only. Those are the thoughts that many times we have. I, I want, I wished, I, if only. And here's the simple truth. Many Christians, many Christians value safety, security, and selfishness over obedience to God. Many Christians value safety, security, and selfishness over God. Safety, security, and selfishness does not equal the abundant life. Your potential is far, far greater than you think. Only when we're able to believe God and trust Him and let Him stretch us to show us our potential, then we're able to experience the abundant life. In John chapter 10, verse 10, Jesus said, the thief, talking about Satan, the thief does not come except to steal, kill, and destroy. That's the enemy game, enemy's game plan. It was a, that was his game plan back with Adam and Eve and all through the ages right up to today for you and me. This is his game plan. He comes to steal, kill, and destroy. But Jesus doesn't stop there. He says, I have come that they may have life and that they may have it more abundantly. Folks, understand, you'll never enjoy the abundant life if your focus is on safety, security, and selfishness. You'll never experience the, the abundant life until you get liberated from those things that are hindering you from conquering your Jericho. Until we're willing to deal with the Jericho in our life, we'll never become the man or woman God wants us to be. Well, back to Joshua. What's the background? Forty years earlier, Moses led Israel out of slavery, out of bondage, out of Egypt. Remember God specifically led them to the Red Sea, opened it up, they crossed, took them into the desert. He brought them right to the brink of the promised land. And he, remember, Moses sent the spies in, they came back and they reported, oh, the land does slow with milk and honey, it's wonderful. But there's giants in the land. Remember the people formed the BTE club? Back to Egypt. And because of unbelief, they wandered in the wilderness for 40 years. Folks, remember, like Israel, our disobedience to God is always, always rooted in our distrust of God. Our disobedience to God is always rooted in our distrust of God. While they wandered in the wilderness, that generation died off, Moses died off, 
and Joshua is chosen to take over. In Joshua chapter 1, verse 5, God says, No man shall be able to stand before you all the days of your life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with you. And then he gives him this great promise. I will not leave you nor forsake you. I will not leave you for, nor forsake you. You know, as believers in the Lord Jesus Christ, if we had a promise like that, couldn't we be strong and bold for the Lord Jesus Christ? Amen? Well, you know, we have been given that promise. In Hebrews chapter 13, verse 7, it's that Jesus said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. We have the very same promise that Joshua has. That Joshua is responsible to finish the job that Moses started. We would say that he's the cleanup hitter for the baseball team. He, he's the one that's going to come on and, and hit them all in home. He's going to lead the people into the promised land. In Joshua chapter 1, Israel is prepared to cross the Jordan River, which we know that required a miracle in itself. In Joshua chapter 2, spies are sent out to check out Jericho. And God only instructed Joshua to take Jericho. At this point, he had not told him how. If Joshua had waited for God to reveal how, he'd have spent another year, 40 years wandering around the wilderness, and he'd have died off with the rest of the generation. Well, that kind of brings us up where we're at here. Today is part one, part one of Steps to Miracle Working Faith. Part one. Now, I'm just going to give you a warning right now. I'm, uh, next week, I'm going to be testing you on these five steps, so I encourage you to memorize them, okay? The first step we need is conviction. The first step we need is conviction. Okay, step number one is what? Conviction. conviction. You got it. Very good. This means being fully persuaded about something. Joshua was fully persuaded that God wanted Israel to take Canaan. Remember how, how Joshua talked to the spies? He said, go and view the land, especially Jericho. God said to Joshua, I have given Jericho into your hand. You see, when God wants us to do something and we have developed a listening heart, then God will tell us exactly what to do. And if we don't get this straight, if we don't get this straight, everything else will be foggy and hazy. And I'm telling you, the last place you want to be is doubting and questioning God when you're in the heat of the battle. You don't want to be questioning and doubting God when you're in the battle. You see, if you are not absolutely sure you are where you ought to be, doing what you ought to be doing, then you'll become frightened and filled with doubt. And not only will you become filled with doubt, the people around you will become frightened and filled with doubt as well. And you're going to go down in defeat. You see, conviction, conviction must be based on a promise from God. Conviction must be based on a promise from God. It's based on the Word of God. A Word of God is an anchor in our soul. Joshua made preparations to cross the Jordan River based on a solid conviction from God. Now, here's a warning. We need to get into Scripture and receive the passage that God wants to give to us. Don't just choose a passage because you like it, because it sounds good. It's, it's a nice, warm, fuzzy. When you're seeking God and asking Him to speak to you, uh, then you've got to be open to whatever He's going to tell you. And sometimes those passages are not warm, fuzzy. Sometimes they're hard to take. But if we're open and receptive, he will speak to us through his word. You see, too often we want to claim verses that we like, but they're really not what God is talking to us about. For example, a lot of people want to pull out Philippians 4.19. And my God shall supply all your needs according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. Well, that is a great promise from God. And then what people do, they claim that and they think, you know what? God promised to supply all my needs, so therefore I can go ahead and do whatever I want to do. I can live any way I want. That's not what God promised. Another one is Romans 8, 28. And we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. And so we claim that promise. We think, well, you know what? I can make any decision I want because God promises he's going to work all things out for good. I can do that. Folks, understand, that's not what God has promised. Many people have their own interpretation, and they use it improperly. We need to get into God's word and allow God to point out a passage pertaining to our situation. You see, Philippians 4.19 and Romans 8.28 both require obedience to God. We must let God give us a passage. That's why we need consistent Bible reading. Step number one is what? Conviction. Step number two, calculation. Calculation. You see, regardless of what we say or think, all of us immediately begin to calculate in our mind. We begin asking questions. We ask ourselves, 
What are the requirements? Okay, if this is what you want me to do, God, what are the requirements? What are the resources I have? What are the risks involved? And what are the rewards involved if I try? We begin by asking ourselves these questions. What are the requirements? What are the resources? What are the risks? What are the rewards? And folks, understand, this is not unspiritual to ask these questions. Joshua was a warrior. He was a soldier. He thought about the huge walls around Jericho, so he sent men to spy out the land. And Joshua shows us the great wisdom. Now remember, how many spies did Moses send out to spy out the land? How many? How, Twelve men, right? Okay. And how many came back with a negative report? Do you know what happened to those ten men? In Numbers chapter 14, verse 37, it says, They died by the plague before the Lord. You want to be very careful about giving negative reports. <laughs> I'm just telling you what it says. <laughs> so 10 came with a negative report. Two came back with positive. Joshua and Caleb. 40 years later, this example had made an impression in Joshua's mind. You see, Joshua is going to send out two men. In Joshua chapter 2, in verse 1, it tells us, Now Joshua, the son of Nun, sent out two men from Micaiah Grove to spy secretly, saying, Go view the land, especially Jericho. So they went and came to the house of a harlot named Rahab, and they lodged there. Now, folks, we don't know anything about these two spies. We don't know their names. We don't know anything about them. We don't know if they were married or they were single. We, we, we absolutely know nothing. But I've often wondered... If one of these spies was married, what was it like when he got back home? What did his wife have to say? Well, Hi, Molly, I'm glad to see you. You're home. Yeah. Where have you been? I have been a nervous wreck. You have been gone for days. I want to know where have you been. Uh, God uh, uh, yeah, God, yep, yep, yep. Do you know what you put me through? God, God, yeah. sent, God sent me on a special mission. I was, on a, I was a spy out the land of Canaan. It's, it's great land. You're going to love it. It's wonderful. God sent me. I had to go. Where have you been staying all these nights? Well, all these one, days you've been gone. Well, one night we stayed in cave. One night, kind of a couple nights spent in the woods. Uh, first night there, we, we actually stayed in the city of Jericho. What did you eat? Uh-oh. Did you eat? Yeah, we ate fruit of the land. It was great. What were you doing in Jericho? Well, that's... Joshua gave us specific orders to check it out. You know what? The people are afraid of us there. Their hearts are melting. We heard firsthand that they're scared. These, some of these people, they want to worship the God of Israel, the God we know. I'm telling you, it was a great plan. Okay, so you were in Jericho. Where did you stay in Jericho? Well, it's kind of like a holiday inn. <laughs> so you walk up... At- to this guy and say, I need to stay at your house? Well, not exactly a a guy. Um, God led us to this this woman who who opened her house, and she actually hit us. She hit us on the roof so that, because the army was coming after us, they were going to kill us, and she actually hit us on the roof so we couldn't couldn't get captured. And her husband was okay with Uh, us? I don't think she had a husband. What what was this woman? Uh, She's a prostitute. <laughs> God led us there. God led us, th- and she she spared us. She she a lot. She covered us over so that night you when know, we lay down. She covered us over. She she tucked us in, and and so that so we 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 could we could <laughs> we couldn't. She let us out the window. You expect me to believe God led you. To a prostitute's house. Yes. To stay there. Do you yes. know what the neighbor next door, Esther, is going to do with this gossip? <laughs> no, I don't know. She is going to make a laughing stock out of us. God sent him to a prostitute's house. That's exactly right. God, yeah, okay. Well, you know what? Maybe God is saying, you sleep on the couch. <laughs> <laughs> Where's Sean? Can I get one of those bunk beds? <laughs> Again, we don't know. We don't know anything about those spies, but it does make you wonder what it was like when he got back there. Uh, see, Joshua gave them very specific instructions. Men, the question is not if 
we're to go into the land. Understand, your parents and that generation, they died out in the wilderness because that's the question they asked. The question is simply this, what does it look like? God had not told Joshua, or God told Joshua what to do, but at this point he had not told him how he was going to do it. So Joshua is calculating in his mind how he's going to go in there and attack this seemingly invincible city. Folks, understand this. If we wait until we have all the answers, uh, all the answers, then we are going to miss God's blessing in our life. If we wait till we have all the answers, we're going to miss God's blessing. We need to move when God says, move, even if we don't know where or how. Joshua calculated the risk. How many men is he going to lose? He, he counted the rewards. He looked at the resources he had. He kept making plans, seeking God to lead him. And this is a good example of miracle working faith. Miracle working faith isn't something that just instantly comes upon us. It, it's, it's not some pill form where you take two of these every single day and you're going to receive power and strength you need to be a man or a woman of great faith. It doesn't work that way. It's a growing process. It's developed over time as we obey God. You know, many years ago, it was decided they're going to build a suspension bridge against a, a wide gorge. And how did they start? They started by taking an arrow and tying a, a, a light twine to it, and they shot the arrow to the other side of the gorge. They had a team working over there. They gave them the signal. They got the, boat, the arrow with the twine, and they fastened uh, some, twine, or some heavier twine to the light twine, and the men pulled it over. And when they got the heavier twine over, they, they signaled to them again, and they fastened a rope to the heavier twine, and they pulled it over. They signaled to the men, and then they fastened a, 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 a cable to the rope. They pulled it over. And when they got the cable over, they, they signaled them, and they fastened an iron chain to that cable, and they pulled it over. They fixed the iron, or the iron chain on each side, and they built a suspension bridge off of that. You see... That's how God works in our life. Miracle working faith begins with like a small string. And as God providentially guides and provides, our small string eventually becomes an iron chain. Well, step number one is what? Conviction. Conviction. Step number two? Calculation. Step number three, you're going to love this step. This is great. Conflict. Expect it. Conflict. Expect it. You will encounter conflict in your steps. It's not seen in this passage, but we go back to Numbers chapter 13. And remember, that's when the spies came back and they're reporting. And, and remember, the people are, oh, what are we going to do? God left it all here to die. And Caleb was one said, no, 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 we can take this. We can do this. We read that Caleb stepped up and said, no, no, God would have us do this. But it's absolutely silent about Joshua. Joshua was silent. I believe Joshua is encountering an inner conflict. And as he's beginning to embrace what God has for him 40 years later, I am certain that the same conflict crossed his mind. What do I mean by conflict? You see, once God clearly tells us to do something, we begin to calculate the risk, the rewards, and how it will affect our resources. What's going to happen? Satan will naturally line up all the demonic forces of hell and begin to fire at us. And if God told, tells us to do something, and your calculation involves three key words, but, if, suppose, drop to your knees and pray. If you hear people telling you these words or you're thinking these thoughts, but, if, suppose, drop to your knees and pray. Most spiritual battles begin in the mind. You see, these three words are a signal for us to pray. Many Christians ignore the source of the conflict. We've been given the armor of God to fight against the enemy's fiery darts. Ephesians chapter 6 tells us what to do. Put on the helmet of salvation, the breastplate of righteousness, the belt of truth, the sandals of peace to take us where we ought to go, that pick up the shield of faith and God's word, the sword. That's what we need to do. We need to understand there is power in the name of Jesus Christ. There's power in the blood of Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. You see, we need to claim that. Claim it verbally and ward off the enemy's accusation and the doubtful thoughts. You see, if there's, it's there and all we have to do is claim it and hang on to the promise that God has shown us. Listen, without conviction, without conviction, you'll end up curling up in a ball and quitting. I believe that's why you see such a dropout rate in ministry today. 
That's why conviction, knowing this is what God has told you to do, is so very important. Years ago, a mental hospital devised a plan to determine whether their patients uh, would be allowed to be released back into society or not. The test was simply this. They would send the patient into the room with a bucket and a mop, and in that room, there was a sink where the faucet was turned on, and the sink was plugged, and the water was flowing out. And they just simply told the patient, go in and mop up the floor. Now, if the patient would go in there and shut the water off and then start mopping up, it was determined they, they should allow that person to go out into society. But if the person went in there and just immediately began cleaning up the floor, mopping the floor without shutting off the source, it was determined that they still need to stay in there for, and have more treatment. He says, Christians are in a constant conflict with the enemy of this world. And, and like the patients in the mental hospital, until we realize the source of the evil, that, 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 that's where our weakness is. Until we understand where the source, the enemy's source is, we're, we're going to end up just going through the motions like the people mopping up the floor and never going to stop. We'll make no real contribution in this world. Most spiritual warfare begins in the mind. It starts with a thought life. And if we're thinking, if, but, suppose. If we're hearing accusations telling us it's impossible, you can never do that. You're, you're falling short. You're never going to make it. You're the wrong man. You're the wrong woman for the job. When we're hearing those accusations, we've got to understand where they're coming from. In 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 4 and 5, it says, For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God for pulling down strongholds, casting down arguments and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bring every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. Folks, that's the key for us. Bring every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. Are you dealing with the source of the conflict in your life? Are you putting on the spiritual armor of God every day? So you cannot go forward in your steps toward miracle-working faith until you get these principles down. Just one of the reasons why so many Christians are being defeated, living defeated lives. When you deal with a conflict, the next step you have to take is cleansing, personal cleansing. Back in Joshua chapter 3, in verse 5, it says, And Joshua said to the people, Sanctify yourself, for tomorrow the Lord will do wonders among you. Sanctify yourself. Personal cleansing is a vital, unavoidable step in miracle-working faith. Personal cleansing is a vital, unavoidable step in miracle-working faith. See, today people say, trust God. Just believe God and he'll give you whatever you want, whatever you need. That's not true. That's a lie, folks. You see, not one place in the Bible tells us that God will give you whatever you want, regardless how you live, or just as long as you believe hard enough. Nowhere do you see that in the Word of God. Everything God does in our lives is to glorify Himself, not to pacify us and give us everything we cry for like a spoiled baby. God is glorified when we willingly yield ourselves to Him and become vessels filled with the Holy Spirit. You know, today, so many people come and say, hey, you want to talk to pastor, what, what's God's will for my life? Young people want to know, uh, pastor, what, what vocation does God want me to go into? What does He want to do in their life? Well, who should I marry? Where should we live? I don't know those questions, but I do know what God's will for you is. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 3, For this is the will of God, your sanctification, that you should abstain from sexual immorality. Your sanctification. That's God's will for you and for me. As believers in the Lord Jesus Christ, God's will is that you and I be sanctified. Not only is it God's will to be sanctified, but in Ephesians chapter 5, in verse 18, it says, And do not be drunk with wine in which is dispensation, but be filled with the Spirit. Remember the original language, it's be filled, be filled, be filled, be filled, be filled. Never stop being filled with the Spirit. So what is God's will for your life? It's to be sanctified, to be Spirit-filled men and women of God. Joshua said, sanctify yourself. What does that mean? What, what is a practical application of this? It means we need to set aside time for confession Set aside time for confession, contrition, or repentance, and cleansing. We need to set aside time for cleansing, contrition, or confession, contrition, and cleansing. 
You see, the wonders of God follow the cleansing. You see, those that think just believing in God is enough miss a pivotal point of miracle-working faith. Remember what it says in 1 Peter 1.16, be holy as I am holy. That's what God says to us. He doesn't say be perfect as I am perfect. He says be holy, be more Christ-like. That's what he wants from us. Strive to be like Jesus Christ. Joshua set aside time for cleansing. He made sure he made right the wrongs that he had done. He, he asked for forgiveness. Understand, cleansing is preparation for God's miracle-working faith in our life. Cleansing is preparation for God's miracle-working faith in our life. Now, you know, we, we, this summer we had some really hot stretches of days, and it looks like the next few days ahead are going to be very, very hot. And I am positive that we all took time to cleanse ourselves, our, our physical bodies. We took baths, we took showers, we washed up, right? We're hot, we're sweaty, we want to get cleaned up. We took time to do that. But do we ever take time for spiritual cleansing? Do we ever take time to just stop and have confession before the Lord? Contrition, cleansing, allowing God, the Holy Spirit, to speak to us? Take time to let God show you things that he wants you to clean up in your life. And then what he ever asks you to do, do it. Okay, quick review. Steps to miracle working faith. Step number one is what? Conviction. Step number two? Calculation. Step number three? Conflict. Expect it. Step number four is cleansing. And step number five is courage. Step number five is courage. Again, back to Joshua chapter 1. In verse 6, God is speaking to Joshua. He says, be strong and of good courage. To this, uh, for to this people you shall divide as an inheritance the land which I swore to their fathers to give them. In verse 7, only be strong and very courageous that you may observe to do according to all the law which Moses, my servant, commanded you. Do not turn from it to the right hand or to the left that you may prosper wherever you go. Verse 9, have I not commanded you to be strong and a good courage? Do not be afraid nor be dismayed, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. Be strong and courageous. God is continually encouraged Joshua over and over and over again. You see, once we make a break with sin and release everything to God and, and willing to clean up our lives, do whatever God has called us to do, what's going to happen? You're going to get a surge of courage. God says, have I not commanded you? After the conviction... Calculation, conflict, cleansing comes to courage. There's a famous American preacher, Henry Ward Beecher. He was conducting services just over the border here in, in, in Indiana, in Indianapolis, Indiana. And he's in there preaching against drunkenness and gambling. And he outraged those who profited from the business. And he walking down the street one night, and a man approached him and shoved a pistol at him. And the man said, take, right, take it back right now or I'll shoot you on the spot. The preacher said, shoot away. And he turned and walked in a different direction. And as he walked away, he said this, I don't believe you can hit your mark as well as I hit mine. I don't believe you can hit your mark as well as I hit mine. Henry Ward Beecher was a man devoted to God. He was filled with courage because he knew God's purpose. He knew God's plan for his life. And he was not afraid to stand up to this man, even though he had a gun. He was courageous. The promise that God gave Joshua, be bold, be strong, for the Lord your God is with you, was a promise that this preacher held on to. We have a promise from God as well. He said, I will never, never leave you nor forsake you. It's a promise that you and I can cling to. And, and God simply wants us to walk in obedience to him, to obey him. Have you taken the first five steps to miracle working faith? Has God, has God given you a conviction? You are fully persuaded this is what God wants you to do. Have you taken the calculation, asking, what are the requirements? What are the resources I have to fulfill this? What are the risks? What are the rewards? Are you in the conflict? Are you in the deadlock because you're repeating those three key words the enemy uses? But, suppose, if. Those three words are tools that can def be defeated by the power of prayer and claiming the protection, putting on the armor of God. You see, stop the source of conflict. Remember the mental hospital? Remember their test? Turn off the source. Turn off the flow first. Step number four, cleansing. 
Are you making sure that the inside of you is cleansed so that you can, the miracle can come in your life? And step number five, courage. You can just tell the opposing forces, go ahead, shoot away. Shoot away, for the Lord my God is with me. Next week, we're going to finish the steps to miracle working faith. But where are you at today? Are you a man or a woman who really wants miracle working faith in your life? Are you caught up and paralyzed because you don't have that kind of faith? Folks, understand the simple truth. God wants you and me to experience the abundant life. Ask him to empower you with the courage and strength to take those steps forward, to be the man or woman of God he's called you to be. If you're able, would you stand with me for prayer? Lord Jesus, we do want to just thank you and praise you for your word as we open it up and look into it. We see the principles that you've given to us, the pattern for each and every one of our lives. And God, I would ask that your Holy Spirit would be moving in each heart and mind that's represented here and, and that we could become men and women of great faith, miracle-working faith in our, in our lives. Lord, you don't give us your word just as a, something nice to read. You give it to us so we can learn, we can develop, we can mature to be all you want us to be. So God, I'm just asking that you, you would work in such a way that we would be bold witnesses for you and God, we would see your hand clearly evident in each and every one of our lives. And we just thank you again for your word. Thank you for what you're doing in our lives. And we commit ourselves to you now in Jesus' name. And all God's people said...